Okay, we'll get started. Uh, I'm Alex Selenikoff, the Dean at the New School for Social Research, and welcome to NSSR Insights, which is a series of talks by NSSR faculty and alumni on the crucial issues of the day and what could be more uh, crucial than what happened here last week with the uh, election again of Donald Trump as President of the United States. To help us understand what happened and why and what it means uh, for the future of democracy in America is David Plotke, Professor of Politics at the New School for Social Research. Welcome, David. Hello. David's topic is why Trump won the 2024 election and what it means. He'll speak for a bit of time. I'll ask him some questions and then we'll take questions from the audience. Feel free to put your uh, questions in the Q&A part of the webinar. And David, over to you. Thanks so much for being here. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And I expect, uh, you know, there'll be quite a few questions. So I'm going to try to be relatively brief, which is, is difficult given the uh, scope of the subject. But um, I, I, I think that the starting point and it's, it, is to characterize the election. And it's, it's simple in a way in sort of terms of political science categories. It, it was a big deal, but not a full-scale political shift. It wasn't 1932, probably wasn't even 1980, but he made a successful move. He won. That's the starting point. Second point is we seem to be in a protracted phase of trench warfare at the national level between two broad political camps. Since about, since 2000, we've had three Democratic elections and four Republican elections. Anyone who knows what will happen in 2028 probably doesn't know much. We're in a long and intense conflict with an uncertain result. A student in one of my classes this week said that the election result felt like a gut punch. I told her that we should all be in the gym as it probably won't be the last one. Many anti-Trump voters and activists in the summer after the convention briefly imagined Harris had become Glinda from The Wizard of Oz, who would sweep the country off its feet on our way to some kind of new Oz. Her victory would vanquish Trumpism. He would retreat to worry about his court cases and properties, and his movement was dissipate. And that was a brief moment of exhilaration. But what we now have is Trump and a succession battle in both parties stretching from tomorrow to 2028. The fact that this was not a classical realignment election or a total earthquake doesn't diminish the strength of the Republican currents that appeared. These signs were evident in the shift of votes toward Trump among Latinos in northern blue states and in strongly democratic cities like this one. So in 2024, Manhattan is the only borough in the city of New York where Trump, where Harris got an overwhelming result. The window is open for a sequence of Republican wins, but it's not guaranteed. Trump gains, the, so the first question then, obviously, is why did he win? He gained strength from several themes regarding his programs and symbols. One of them was strong opposition to unauthorized mass immigration, which was very popular. Two was a negative view of Biden's economic performance, especially regarding inflation which was also a very popular position. Three was his critique of real and alleged cultural radicalism in and near the Democratic Party, which is a complicated question in every respect. Four is a claim that hasn't got much attention in the post-election coverage, and I'm not gonna talk about it a lot, but good for discussion that Biden and the Democrats were, were weak and foolishly multilateral in international politics. All these themes 
intersected democratic divisions. For example, think about immigration. Public concern about immigration has ranked in the top three of public issues in the last few years. And Trump sustained and amplified his vehemently anti-immigration position. This is good politics. It responds to a public concern, but also works on a democratic division, which briefly could be described like this. Many Democrats support something like the Obama policies, which are less restrictive than than Trump, but uh, but but you know seriously stringent regulation. Others reject just about any limit on immigration. That's a sharp division, which was muted in part during Trump because he was so. Uh, a, vehement, so abusive, so cruel in his conduct of his policy, that that distinction was was not a priority, but it became quite salient in the Biden administration, and it meant near paralysis in the first few years of Biden's administration, when Harris not only didn't want to go near the border, she didn't even want to talk about why she didn't want to go to the border. Trump also did well with two more symbolic aspects of the campaign. Uh, I think these were both these are strategic as well. It's hard to draw a line. But one is he avoided contexts that would manifest his growing problems with clarity and focus, notably after his debate with Harris. He was he was uh, self-deluded for a minute, debating against the Biden of 2024, he was Christopher Hitchens or Gore Vidal. Against Harris, quite competent as a debater, he was another 80-year-old guy who couldn't make his point. So that was one factor among many that led him simply to avoid the mainstream media in favor of chatting with Joe Rogan. He also did something remarkable. I think he did it for his audience. I doubt if he did it for the people who are listening to this uh, event. Rather than apologizing for his multiple crimes, he tried to refashion himself as a charming rascal, a right-wing George Clooney. Yeah, I've done some stuff that I probably shouldn't have done, but so what? So what if I'm outside the line with a sense of humor? He made no apologies for his shady record, but sought to be an endearing, clever, agile, and unconventional leader, as well as occasionally a thug. I've cited reasons for Trump's strong performance with an electoral result this close. Nothing was bound to happen. It's always tempting for social scientists, for everybody to say once something happens, It had to happen. Well, it didn't. So the next step is how do we assess Harris and the Democratic performance? A fair summary, Harris and her campaign were better than expected, a lot better actually, but not great. Remember, Harris failed badly in 2020 as a presidential candidate. She did not command attention as vice president. This record actually explains what is sometimes a puzzle, why Biden remains so long. We've put too much weight on his self-image, including comments by Nancy Pelosi that are, that essentially uh, criticize him for sticking around and not seeing himself. It, uh, it, there's two kinds of dishonesty in that. It's not just Nancy Pelosi. One is, it's totally implausible that she and her friends at the top of the party couldn't see Biden's decline in 2022-2023. A big problem at that time was that Democratic leaders did not see Harris as a very appealing alternative. They knew very well that they could put a primary together if they shoved Biden out of the way. They feared that an open democratic primary process would undermine her standing 
without producing a clearly superior alternative. There was no Obama in the wings in 2023. There was Bernie Sanders always willing to lose again, and several Democratic hopefuls who might have been dynamite and more likely would have been Kane or Waltz. Harris would most likely have won an open primary. That's what happens generally, not always, with sitting vice presidents, but she is much more likely to, or as likely to, have emerged from such a primary process as, as someone who was bruised and weakened than as somebody who was valorized by the, by the primary. When somebody loses a relatively close election, there are lots of accounts of what happened and what should come next. With the vast mass of commentary, I set up, after the election, I set up what I thought was going to be a file for my students of reasonably interesting commentaries on the election. Uh, and I use that widely, uh, broadly. Uh, within a week or so, I had 90 to 100 uh, items in that folder. So it's, it's, there's a torrent of stuff. But I would say... Um, Within that, and you've probably all done some of that reading, beware of a couple things. Anyone who says that what happened confirms what they have been saying all along is probably misleading you. This stance is at best tedious. Maybe they were partly right. It is also, and, and I, I could cite 10 articles, but that would kind of ruin the spirit of this kind of event. It's only a few unhappy steps from claiming you knew it all the time toward a nearly conspiratorial claim that I knew the truth about what Harris had to do, but powerful agents prevented her and other leaders from enacting my advice. Second, be cautious about a genre of commentary that I would call pseudo or polemical self-criticism. That is, the, this article starts out by saying, we must look carefully at why the Democrats lost. Via this introspection, I've quickly discovered that my adversaries were just as terrible as I always knew. So this is a, a frequent kind of commentary that won't get you any far, very far. Here are the main contenders in efforts to explain why Harris and the Democrats lost an election they might have won. Let me underline that point one more time. This is still a close election, could have turned out differently, not super determined, was open quite late in the game, and we have to think of possibilities. One frequent claim, why, why Harris lost, why the Democrats lost, they had a poor candidate. She was much better than she was in 2020, but she still appeared as vague and uncertain about policies and aims. She was smart, self-confident, and suitably indifferent to Trump's bluster and abuse. At the same time, she was weak on new or any compelling ideas, repeatedly evading questions that were meant to set her up for outlining interesting plans. She also seemed, this is another case of division, caught between her 2019-2020 leftist persona and her 2024 center-left stance. She might be done as a presidential candidate. This was not a great showing, though not terrible. But she won't be done if the field looks as weak in three years as it did in mid-2023. Second explanation, this is more from the right, I think, typically, though, though I, it, it, it travels a little bit. Democrats were dishonest. And of course, when people on the right say this, you can, you can immediately shower them with, with laughter and even abuse by saying, you know, you're, <laughs> Trump or you guys are accusing Harris of being dishonest. Well, of course, that's a good line, but there were some problems. Somebody, wasn't me, wasn't Alex, but a whole bunch of people 
were dishonest about Biden's declining condition from 2022 into 2024. Most of the people in this imaginary room have had older parents and relatives who gradually decline in various ways, whatever the age, and it's extremely rare that somebody just falls off a cliff in a year. Democrats were dishonest about whether there was a, quote, crisis at the border in the first years of the administration and allowed the Republicans to make that into their talking point. They were delayed, if not dishonest, about recognizing that inflation was a serious problem until everybody thought it was. All these modes of dishonesty were more about political division within and around the Democrats rather than bad character. The big one these days on the left, semi-left, is the claim that the Democrats abandoned the working class. This is an interesting one, I think. Taken literally, it's an absolutely silly claim. In recent decades, Biden was the most strongly pro-union president we have had, for example. What Bernie Sanders means, others mean other things, is that Biden did not aggressively pursue a combination of left populist and social democratic policies, the ones they prefer. The, the problem for Democrats is that listening doesn't really seem to be the problem. There is little evidence that any large number of people wanted these policies, though as certainly public support for the existence of unions, the usual accounts of Biden abandoning the working class rely on the wrong idea that left Democrats have a popular and viable package of structural reforms that would elude the deep anti-government sentiment of recent decades. Maybe such a package can be built but it is not now on anyone's desk. The working class, in quotes, seems to want things that are hard to deliver and not always the first preference of democratic leaders. They want rising wages and income more than they seem to want greater equality, more than they want regulation, more than they want environmental protection. They want to limit or end inflation rather than support a broad range of government projects that might, but not necessarily, augment it. They, want, they tend to want less regulation via the anti-government sentiment that is so widespread as to be almost like the air in American politics. What if Democrats, quote, listen to the working class and hear people loudly say positions that they don't share. The next one is complicated, but in a different, different way. The claim is, and this is, I would say this is the sort of center, uh, a trope of center left criticism now. Uh, and to some extent, the, the Sanders people do this as well. And they call it identity politics that they don't like. But the yeah, the claim is that Democrats were hostage to cultural and policy radicalism. There's something here, but critics within and around the Democratic Party risk throwing out both the baby and the bathtub. The Democratic Party relies on alliances with a range of movements, as it should. Calls for cultural and social change, that, and this is, I think, key, come from decentralized movements with no central authority or coherent leadership structure. Advocates of the most radical version of proposed changes claim that their views capture the core of the movement. Then Democrats are caught between accepting positions that they know are politically risky or appearing to sideline and disrespect political forces they generally support and whose aid they need. As movements radicalize, no one in the movement or the party has the authority to compel a self-limiting moment. So 
police reform broadly supported though contentious becomes defunding or even abolishing the police which becomes terrible baggage for the democrats after 2021 i'll use a counter example to illustrate this we could talk about it more every example is is difficult and and contentious but um a few years ago, this is a counterexample in the sense that this radicalization was somewhat limited. A, a few years ago, Democrats, feminists, and gay and lesbian political forces waged a campaign for gay marriage, which was actually wonderfully described in a, a book by a former colleague here, uh, Diva Woodley. A non-trivial number of advocates felt uncomfortable with that reform, with gay marriage, as on grounds that getting rid of discrimination should mean rejecting marriage altogether to unburden both gay and straight people uh, of a broken institution. If the big slogan of the movement had become smash or even eliminate marriage, how would it have gone? Another story i actually am 10 more minutes okay alex um another claim this is more on the nation and and similar uh, uh publications the democrats should have taken a much more critical view of israel some claim that doing so whatever, whatever your actual position on the matter might have mobilized parts of several ethno-religious groups, including Arab Americans, as well as some younger people on the political left. Maybe there will end up being a state for which this is a plausible interpretation. Michigan is the best candidate. I can't see a broader case just on the basis of returns and exit polls. Any anybody the the surprising the key to that is that the surprising distribution of votes by Jews was eighty percent for Harris, which I would not have expected. Okay, that suggests it doesn't demonstrate. It suggests that there were lots of pro-Israel votes to be lost by the move that is being re recommended in the nation and elsewhere. There's merit to, or at least interest, to all these accounts of democratic failure, but, and I guess this is the theme of, of the talk overall, not enough to tell us that Harris had to lose. Does say the election had to be close. We proceed in this extended conflict between two broad political camps with no certain outcome. What else did we learn about American politics in this campaign? I'll mention three points briefly and then uh, stop. First, and this is for the, I guess, the sociologists and the political sociologists, uh, I'm putting it in quotes in a way, Daniel Bell was right. About 80 years ago after his famous book, about, about 80 years after his famous book on post-industrial society, uh, we learned again that the class politics alignments of the late 19th and much of the 20th century are no longer the driver of politics in OECD countries. What Daniel Bell didn't say, he couldn't possibly have predicted this, is a surprise that in the U.S. we nearly have a complete inversion in which more education and more liberal to left politics are strongly linked until we get into Musk territory and the, the ultra billionaires have bailed on the Democrats. So as I said before, there's only one borough in New York where uh, Harris gets a really strong majority. It's this one, Manhattan, where um, the faculty and students of the middle school have to, are soon gonna have to move to uh, Newfoundland for uh, housing because it's so expensive to live in Manhattan, but the actual residents of all kinds are 80 to 90%, 85% for Harris. We, the, to underline this, we don't have a good explanation of 
this deep process of inversion, essentially, that not only is the bell claim that things are changing correct, but things have changed in a way that 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 couldn't have been, I don't think, anticipated. We can discuss competing explanations. We need a new political sociology. This is my second point. Many people say that the Democrats lost or didn't pay attention to the working class. This claim intersects a new framing that has somehow taken over the, the, the sort of more intelligent popular literature and accounts. We are now defining people who didn't um, go to, people who didn't graduate from college are the working class and those who did are the elite. I think there's a bit of sentimental leftism here, but it doesn't get much traction on this complicated sociological and economic map that we're doing politics in. People who graduated from high school but went no further amount to less than 30% of the population. Many people, almost the same number, went to college for a real period of time, and lots, 15%, got associate degrees. Together, they constitute a group nearly as large as people who only went to high school. Depicting, so the point is that's a very broad, large, complicated group, hard to, to simply lump as, quote, the working class and, and, and convey much meaning. Depicting college graduates as the elite might even be sillier, as it means considering that this elite includes well over a third of the population. And just the common sense of that term, where what kind of elite is that that is a third of the, of the uh, group being discussed? The college high school formulation also ignores a crucial income and education cleavage between those who got a BA and the 15% of the population, probably 90% of the people in this audience who had a further academic or professional de degree. I don't have the map yet. We're gonna need to produce it to figure out what politics looks like. We do know that income rises dramatically with education, so does liberalism. I do not recommend, though I imagine, we could send tour buses from Manhattan to Kansas or Ohio so New Yorkers can meet the working class. Probably that won't work. We need to figure out how new social and political alignments work. The last point I'll make, and I'll stop so as not to intrude too much on discussion and other themes to be raised, is, a, is actually a very difficult one for the broad left, democratic and non-democratic. The electoral map of ethnicity and race that people have been using for the last quarter century, if not longer, won't work. For at least that long, democratic and left political analysts have relied, not casually but deeply, on the idea that a solid and expanding center-left and left block of non-white voters would undergird major political initiatives was that was if not the foundation at least an essential aspect of any notion of of democratic with a small d politics this partly imaginary force has splintered one component blacks remains very strongly democratic but within the black part of that broader group, there's a deep division between center-left and more leftist political forces. The fastest growing and now largest group, Latinos, just barely leans Democratic, maybe 50 to 55 percent, with signs of further shifts toward the Republicans. And this has been relatively rapid because a few years ago, people would say, well, not all Latinos are uh, you know, pro-democratic, there are, and then people would say, yeah, I know about Cubans, but now we know about Mexican-Americans in South Texas, et cetera, et cetera. Asians, 
a rapidly growing group are closer to Latinos than Blacks in their orientation. We have burgeoning ethno-racial variety along with the relative political isolation of Blacks, who along with Jews and people with PhDs in the social sciences constitute outlier groups who vote more than 80% Democratic. So this last list of um, possible explanation of, of additional factors, you know, produces a sort of bleak view. But what I mean it to be, I mean it to be challenging about things that we need to figure out uh, in order to um, uh, compete effectively in American politics in the next few years. There will be an immediate divide between two kinds of emphases, and I have no desire to try to adjudicate it in two minutes, but just name it. There's a divide between uh, one perspective on what to do could be called constitutionalism. That is to try to build, uh, strengthen, maintain whatever guardrails we can find that prevent the Trump administration from reaching its most authoritarian potential. The other program is program, policy, innovation about some of the questions that I've indicated, which is very hard work and, and very difficult. In heaven, we could easily do both at the same time. In the, the next political period starting next week or after the inauguration, whenever you say, we'll have to juggle both things in ways that I can't provide a schedule for. So that's that's uh, those are my remarks. Thank you for joining us. I'll stop. David, thanks so much. Um, I've got a, a, a few questions. People can put questions in uh, in the Q&A. Um, and I want to uh, start by focusing in on the election and then move to the last uh, last points you made here. So I, let me go to the very beginning of your talk. You said this wasn't um, a realignment. First of all, what what, what constitutes a realignment in politics? Uh, and why wasn't this a realignment with the Republicans taking the presidency, the Senate, and um, holding on to the House? Um, you can you can do it a, as a numerical institutional distinction or a thematic one. Uh, the, numerically, institutionally, the Democratic, the Republican win doesn't match the historic cases that we think of as sweeping and dramatic uh, uh, reshaping in which uh, the president gets not just barely over 50% of the vote, but 55 or 60%. The losing party is, is thoroughly diminished and marginalized. And in which the, the party that wins has a commanding majority in the House and Senate. If in pre-polarization days, the current House and Senate would be very ripe for poaching from the Republican Party. You know, that, that very easy to imagine, used to be easy to imagine winning a few senators, a few Congress people. Now, that's very difficult. But after 1932, or in a different way, just for a moment after 1980, you, you, you couldn't imagine poaching that would make any difference because all the institutions were aligned. Thematically, um, the idea of a realignment suggests some broad new public ordering or po conception of what politics should be about and how things should be that not only has a majority, but defines the terms of discussion, okay? What kind of administrative state should we have in the 30s and 40s? rather than not having one, okay? What kind of, if you want to use the term neoliberalism, what kind of neoliberalism should we have in the 80s and 90s rather than what having it? Trump, Trump's uh, effort is that he doesn't have, uh, he has some points of emphasis, but I don't think he's swept the country uh, behind him in some uh general conception of what we should do. And he's the, that's a problem that you get into, certainly compared to uh, um, Roosevelt, 
to Reagan, to whoever else you could think of, much more personalistic. So realigning behind a guy is, is a tough act. So those are the distinctions I would draw. Okay. So um, we don't have the final numbers of votes yet, but it, it looks like Trump did slightly better than four years ago, but Harris did significantly worse in terms of perhaps five, six, seven million fewer votes than Biden got. Um, I guess this goes to your non-realignment point. There wasn't a big switch to to Trump. It's a, a lot of Democrats stayed home. That may ultimately be the story here, I suppose. Um, why, though? What were the major factors, do you think, in this um, really rather dramatic, what appears to be dramatic decrease in uh, Democratic turnout? Excuse uh, me, I should say, particularly with having raised a billion dollars and this vaunted ground game the Democrats kept talking about that they had in place. So so there's always two kinds of explanations of that. You just discounted one, which is the get out the vote or the campaign structure was inadequate and didn't reach a public that was reachable. The other more plausible one is, is essentially a disappointment in, in Biden. Uh, and that that it wasn't people people withdrew to the margins uh, because they 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 didn't like what happened during the Biden administration. And you could even one term that's arisen in discussing these people, these potential Democrats who didn't vote, is uh, uh, cross pressured. That is, they they really didn't like Biden but they couldn't bring themselves to vote for Trump. So- Or if, apparently Harris. I mean, I mean, right. But I mean, if they if they are pushed away from the Democrats by inflation, by whatever other combination of things, they, they uh, and in the, if this is the right analysis, we, for once, we're not disappointed in non-voting, but they say, I really don't like Biden. I, I'm not sold on Harris, but I can't bring myself to vote for Trump. I just can't do it. So, so what we're saying is that the 81 million people who voted for Biden four years ago, compared to maybe the 75 million this year, or slightly more for Trump, really really shows the Democratic majority is there still. It just wasn't uh, mobilized. Yeah, there's one qualifier to not throw out our friends on the left altogether. There's probably within that group some set, I'd say 10 or 15 percent, who were pissed off at Biden from the left, not from the center right. And yet, similarly, they couldn't bring themselves to to uh, to vote for Trump even less. But so I think there's probably a, a broad swath of uh, potential Democrats. I'm interested that you mainly attribute the the fall off in Democratic votes to people not liking. Biden rather than, I mean, because he did get 81 million votes, but rather uh, not liking Harris. Occasionally, there's a little fragment of polling that almost seems to prove something. And in this case, I just happen to remember one, which is that at the end of the day, uh, uh, Harris polled as more popular, likable, re responsible, better person, the person you'd rather have a beer with in a bar, what, you know, all the usual ways these questions. She did better than than uh, Trump. So, so if people were not people were sold on Harris, partly for good reason. You know, she did a good job. She's a smart, professional person. She handled herself well. But they weren't. They weren't. They were convinced that she was a solid citizen, a good person. But they weren't convinced to vote for her. So uh, take this one step further. So there was a lot of thinking up until right before the election that uh, the women, the, the, the vote of women would be absolutely crucial. It would overwhelmingly go for Harris and carry the day. There was the poll out of Iowa, uh, this famous poll out of Iowa just a few days before the weekend right. before that it was explained by saying older women were voting overwhelmingly uh, for Harris. But when the numbers came in, although Harris did win more uh, votes of war, more women than Trump did, uh, she won a pretty substantially uh, smaller percentage of women votes than Biden did. That seems entirely counterintuitive. And what, do you think it's counterintuitive? And what do you think happened? Uh, 
Yes, I think it's counterintuitive. No, I don't know what happened. I, I think there, I, there's, there's two possibilities, and this is, we'll, we'll probably find out, but now I don't know. There, there are people, and they, they show up in interviews who say, uh, women who say, I really care about abortion, but I care more about inflation. And you can substitute for inflation five other things, okay? Even people who say, I really care about abortion, but I care more about uh, illegal immigration, okay? So that seems to be going on uh, quite a bit. Um, there, there's another possibility, which will take some real research to determine, is whether one perverse effect of Dobbs was to make abortion less of an issue in which it's being resolved at the state level. In other words, it, it, it stands, intuitively, it stands to reason that since the um, national abortion ban that many of the Republicans would actually like to enforce, to get, that seems not on the table, realistically, in the near future. I could be dreaming, but I think that's probably true. So it could be that if you live not just in blue states, but in states with some uh, anti, you could call it an anti-Dobbs or pro Roe v. Wade uh, measure that's been adopted, the, the, they are not going to vote on the basis of uh, national candidates' uh, abortion views as strongly. I haven't seen that written, so I think it's semi-original, but that's no guarantee that it's true. I don't I don't. Which actually shows that, I mean, Trump said this a year or two ago after Dobbs, that this is turning things back to the states and that maybe one year he, he nearly, may really have gotten that right, even though people thought Dobbs was going to be the key to the election for the Democrats. He he. This is one of the many issues on which he speaks in two very different ways, depending who's talking to. When he's when he's talking to an audience that includes a, a range of people with different views, he does the back to the states thing. When he's with his right to life buddies, he says this is a step uh, toward the national abolition of abortion that, of course, we all really want. I guess my point about that is that that doesn't seem within reach, realistically, in anything like the current political configuration. Um, I wanted to go back to your, you had um, four, maybe five in the end, explanations about why the Harris loss um, uh, was not uh, in that. I mean, you took, you picked apart other people's explanations for why she lost and thought none was particularly persuasive, and and you were not convinced at the end that her loss was inevitable. So I guess I got to turn that around to you and say, so what campaign do you think she could have run that that would have won for her? Uh, I can cite three things. Whether or not they're two, they're all risky. That, that she might have tried that might have made a difference, okay? I think she probably picked the wrong uh, vice president, okay? Uh, I, I, that was hotly contested within the Democratic Party at the time. And all we can say for sure is Waltz didn't pay off. You know, his he as soon as he got his clock cleaned by Vance in the debate, God help us, then it was obvious that he was he was not going to uh, bring any big uh, um, bonus beyond what Harris would bring, and the the leading alternative probably was Shapiro. And um, you know, leaving aside arguments on the left about Israel slash Gaza, uh, I think there's it's not a terrible bet to say that Shapiro would have. Uh, made a difference in in Pennsylvania, so that one move might have uh, been enough to get her close. No guarantee. Move two, th this this um, this was maybe at the limit of what she or many politicians could do on a series of issues in 2019, 2020. She took positions that were very much in the spirit of that time, uh, George Floyd. Uh, uh, people's dig deep sickness with Trump, and she campaigned pretty far to the left in 2020. She says now in 2024 that 
she has continuity of principle, but not of position. So what would be hard for her or any politician to do is take a couple of those and work them through in public and say, I said this, uh, that I agree 70% with myself, 30% I don't agree with, here's how I have rethought things. That That's asking a lot, you know, but it's, it's not, um, uh, it's not unreasonable, it's just very hard. Third thing uh, uh, is to come up with four things that sound like the child tax credit. That is, that, that don't sound like the social democratic restructuring of everything, but, but things that you could actually sell that would have some effect on incomes and family well-being and are limited in that sense. And, if there were four, I missed them. I don't think there were many, and and I don't know whose fault that is. Okay, uh, it's not Teresa Gillarducci's fault. It's not, um, uh, you know, it's it's not Will Milberg's fault. Uh, it's it's um, it's a collective fault. Uh, that that I, the, the first one I think is um, is really is really on her. The choice of. Uh, um, Waltz rather than Harris is a is a wrong play. The second one, I I don't know her. Do you know her personally? No. Uh, so I don't know if that's just an unreasonable ask. For for some politicians, it would who are otherwise quite talented, splendid people. They, that's just not part of the deal. So I don't know if that's unreasonable. The third one is not her fault because that was never her thing to begin with, right? Yeah. So th those are three things that, you know, we're talking about making switches of, let's say the, the, the final uh, uh, difference is what in the range of 4 million, you're probably looking at numbers or thinking of them. Uh, yeah. So, so to change the outcome requires at most and probably not even, um, um, million and a half, two million. People. Well, actually, actually, I think to win to win the the, the blue wall states, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania required a a change of vote of a, a two hundred and fifty, two hundred and sixty thousand votes. So that's actually one hundred and twenty five thousand Trump voters voting for Harris, and she wins those three states. Well, we would have had two wonderful fiestas had that happened. One would have been the Trump campaign's explosion at the idea they won the popular vote and lost the Electoral College. And the, the other is the army of uh, political scientists and political theorists who spent the last couple of decades denouncing the Electoral College would suddenly call conferences to start discovering its virtues. So right. happily, we don't get either of those. Okay. Um... The um, with there's a, a question here in the in the Q and A about uh, the, the last line is is there a simplistic explanation that a strong, tall, and I assume white man uh, defeated a woman of color? You dealt a little bit in your last explanation about the role of race by saying um, that Hispanics were more evenly split and and Asian Americans uh, as well, but it's it's kind of hard to blink the fact that race and gender were were. Hard to think that they didn't play some kind of role here. Do you think? I I think it's uh, the question is reasonable, and the answer is partly yes. And it's extremely difficult to figure out where it is because what you're what you're looking for at this point is a is a record, identifiable group of uh, prospective Harris voters who bailed out because Harris is female. Okay, and complexity of that now is in po polling and related things. Nobody will cop to that stuff anymore. You know, nobody when they do the retrospective polling, nobody's going to say, "Well, you know, I really liked the Democratic policies and everything like that, but I liked, I, I want a country led by a man." So it's it's somehow embedded in other things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I think the race is less likely. I mean, that 
country had a lot of trouble electing Obama, but was able to do it twice with first a very large majority, second a, 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 a decent one. So it's hard to see the argument that things got more right. So, so I don't even know what the argument would be. There'd be things got so much more racist in the last uh, 12 years that, that uh, Obama was electable, but not Harris. I think uh, maybe there is an argument. I can't rule it out. And I'm sure, sure some of the dislike of Harris on the right has a racial dimension. There's no question. But I think the gender I I issue is probably uh, more salient in the narrow sense of explaining voter choice. So I, I think you're probably looking for uh, very divided voters who uh, uh, take that as an excuse not to vote for Harris, even if they don't quite admit to themselves that that's what they're doing. Well, and you did, I mean, on the gender side, you did have both Clinton, uh, Hillary Clinton and uh, and Harris losing. So rather than the comparison between Obama and, and Harris, so there's- Yeah, yeah, uh, so there's, there's something. something there. Yeah, although but both- The other both thing is you really, you really, I mean, not to get too casual about this, but you really have to be uh, desperate for images of manliness to find Trump as a satisfactory remedy for, for Harris. I mean, what's that? Well, it's strength. I don't know, but it could be that both uh, Clinton and um, Harris had uh, vice presidents whose first name was Tim. I wonder if the social scientists are going to look at that possibility, you know, but uh, more seriously, you know, um, Harris never came up with an answer on inflation, not really inflation. He said inflation was going down, but price level. So, you know, every time any of us goes into a supermarket now, on a, how many ever times a week we do it? Um, we buy six things and suddenly it's much, much more than we thought it was going to be. And that kind of hit people in the face daily. Um, and I just wonder whether there was anything she could have said or done or, I mean, my, it's my very simplistic explanation for what happened here was the, the cost, not, not inflation level, but the actual cost of living. But without opining on that, what, what was there an argument that the campaign could have made that might have been successful on that point? No, not not in. Uh, what are they going to say in two thousand twenty four? It wasn't true. Uh, the the you know the issue would have been was there something they could have done or at least said in two thousand when inflation was uh, you know rampant. And I think that talking. I mean, they did something like what they did with the border by saying it. You know, it's not yet. A, it's not a big deal. Okay. And I don't know that they had the capacity to stop it uh, without taking measures that wouldn't have had other negative consequences. Well, you know, we're we're both old enough to remember the uh, the price controls that Richard Nixon put into place. That that came and went. No one's ever mentioned that again. But uh, that, you know, uh, it, th this one just uh, at an angle to what you said. This might be one area where the not listening to the working class theme might play a little bit because it, the people talk about the price of eggs, okay? Um, and I think the households in the Beltway and policymakers and uh, most professors, including the ones here, people genuinely don't care about the price of eggs. You, 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 and not, you notice the price of eggs went up, but so what, okay? You know, unless it quintupled or, or something more. But the household prices that went up and immediately impacted, let's say, median income and below families are not things that would have been palpable to the uh, uh, Democratic uh, upper Elite. middle class. <laughs> I'm avoiding that word, but you know. The new school professors, as as we know, are not wealthy, but when you go to the market, you don't you, you get eggs or not, depending upon whether you're making an omelet. You don't you don't carefully think about whether you can afford the eggs, right? Yeah. Um, and end with this question. Um, so Trump made a lot of 
promises during the campaign. He was cutting taxes for everybody for uh, on social security, on wages and tips. He was going to get rid of the limitation on deductions of uh, state and local taxes, uh, all sorts of things. Um, he was he's going to close the border and deport tens of millions of people, and he's going to raise um, uh, tariffs uh, to very high levels. Um, what, in your estimation, likelihood of accomplishing this, and what would what's the likelihood? I know this is a very unfair question of Democrats being able to say in two years. Um, so, what did he do for you guys? Um, I think in two years he'll be able to say, he'll be able to. Uh, if the Senate cooperates and the House shows some of these symbolic things as accomplishments, you can reduce or eliminate taxes on tips. It is it just isn't a big fiscal deal. Okay, people will like that. You can do another tax reduction fiesta, and this gets back to one uh, theme I was raising in the class. I don't know the answer to this, but I would put it this way: the the so-called working class that we're all talking about now seems to care more about raising income than creating more inequality. So tax cuts are appealing. And when we, people of, of good, uh, you know, uh, democratic and equitable hearts say, but the tax cuts are going to increase inequality yet more and it's already ridiculous a lot of people say yeah you know, i don't care you know if that's the price of if, if we have to raise tax cuts to across the board or even disproportionately and i pay fewer taxes when income increases i'm happy and so the medium-term consequences of that will not be so great probably for reasons that many in the audience are familiar with the the other the, I think he can reasonably hope to have him. Uh, oh, on the deportations, um, he's going to run into even his Supreme Court on some of this stuff. Uh, and so it'll be a question of how much he can do that is not purely symbolic, uh, and, but, but within some kind of legal framework. Okay. And I think there he will come up with less than he promised. The, the other thing that he has going for him, um, and I think this could be a whole other discussion topic, is um, does does the uh, tropism of the new tech guys toward Trump? Does that two interpretations? Maybe I'll end on this. One one is that it's just pure rent seeking. It's not interesting from a political economy or growth perspective. It's just that they know he's going to get con out of the regulation business. He's going to uh, be nice to them. He's going to fight with the Europeans to uh, lower some of the fines on the, the tech companies. And there's nothing really there. Okay, that's possibility one. Possibility two is that by that the Musk and associates are going to come up with new forms of encouraging growth that we can't even be sure of and that will boost Trump. And if I knew the answer to that, I would be uh, doing something on my TIAA account tonight. Okay. David, thanks so much uh, for being with us. Um, really interesting conversation. Uh, you made no predictions that I can hold you to, so you're safe on that 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 account. But you shed a lot of light, and that's been great. Thank you so much for being with us, and that concludes our our NSSR insights uh, for this month. Thanks, David. Thank you.